Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 37, I talk with Mark Waldrop about producing 3D private music performances on Blu-ray. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, Episode 37 3D Private Performances. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here with UltimateAVMag.com and HomeTheaterMag.com. This week's guest geek is Mark Waldrop, founder, president, and chief engineer of AIX Records and a previous guest on the show. Hey, Mark, welcome back. Hi, hi Scott. Good to be back. It's really nice to have you back. Uh, those of you who are tuned into the live video stream at uh, live.twit.tv or logged on to the chat room at irc.twit.tv, can post questions for Mark, and I'll pass along as many as I can. We're going to be talking today about uh, Mark's new project, uh, AIX Records' uh, production of 3D music videos, which I was fortunate enough to attend one of the initial recording sessions, uh, which included uh, shooting in 3D video. So, Mark, uh, what led you to decide to shoot your video uh, in 3D for these projects? Uh, first, let me let me back up a step uh, because you referred to them as 3D music videos. Oh. There are a, there are a number of people out there doing 3D music videos. You know, the short subject, take a song, run the story, and shoot what what uh, Hollywood and record companies do as in 3D and mm. post them. There are also 3D concerts. The U2, uh, Miley Cyrus, and and so forth have been done. But I kind of came up with it with a slant that's an extension of what we've been doing for the last 10 years anyway, which is mm -hmm. a private performance, not even concert, uh, because there's no pyrotechnics, no PA system, that kind of thing. No um, audience for that matter. There's no audience, exactly. You become the audience in your space. Mm. So I call them 3D music albums. Mm. Um, okay. And, and that we did six of them, as you, as you remember, uh, back in, in June. The genesis for that, or at least the thinking was, that we're doing these, these projects as as one session uh, re record making. I mean, nobody really does it that way unless it's a live concert. And even live concerts, they'll record a number of evenings in the same venue or presentations of the same program and edit and, and mix between them. In fact, what we do is bring everybody into this uh, space in downtown, the, the Zipper Auditorium, and uh, have them do their tunes, play their music, uh, whether it's vocal or jazz or whatever it happens to be, classical included. And then we capture it, obviously, with the, the number one aspect of, of, of my passion is to get the music done right so that we can have high resolution, multi-channel, surround sound, several different mixes, or, or even a stereo mix at 96 kilohertz, 24 bits in PCM. And because they're all there at the same time, we've been shooting video. Uh, early on, if you have a copy of Paul Smith or some of the ones we did 10 years ago, You'll notice that everybody's, you know, dressed casually. There's no lights around. We didn't even have camera operators at the time. We just pointed a camera at, at Paul, and he came in with his Hawaiian shirt, shorts, and, and gym shoes. Um, things have progressed a long, a long way since then, from standard def cameras up to high def, which we started doing about six years ago. And then I got wind um, through sort of late last year and on into CES, and certainly by NAB time in April, that 3D was a, an exciting new technology. I know some of the people at the 3D at Home Consortium. Um, I'm part of the 3D working group at the CEA. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I think this might should be just, just the coolest thing to experiment with. And, and to be perfectly honest, at the beginning, I regarded it as a, as a gimmick. That mm -hmm. this would be something to draw attention to AIX and the things that we do. Once people hear the audio, they'll be hooked. But let's, you know, all those 1.8 or whatever the projections are for people buying 3D uh, television sets, let's give them something other than sports and, and, uh, and movies, Avatar, which are kind of one-time events for me. Let's give them something like what we do, except you can enjoy the music and, and see people as if you're looking through a window in 3D. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, after having then 
explored a little bit about what the costs were. I mean, I, I have estimates for one camera operator for one day, upwards of seventy thousand dollars. Yikes! Way outside of my my budget, and and so I uh, I managed to to swing some relationships with people that I've known for twenty years, and and uh, including uh, Bernie Mitchell. Um, and and Doug Layton from Panasonic, who hooked me up with uh, Jan Crittenden at, at Panasonic back in New Jersey. And I sort of pleaded my case that I do this different thing, and wouldn't it be cool if they could provide me the technical support uh, as far as monitors and these cameras that they've come up with um, to shoot in 3D and deliver what I do, except now with the 3D component on a Blu-ray disc. And at the very last second, they said, sure, we can we can do that. And lo and behold, that's when I invited you down. And we spent three days plus a preliminary day here with the cameraman playing with the cameras because nobody had had their hands on these prototype machines mm -hmm. in order to, to figure out what works, what doesn't work. Because there's a whole lot of additional complexity when you're shooting in 3D than when you're doing it in standard 2D. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we had on uh, the podcast... Um Oh, a couple months ago now, I think uh, two of your stereographers who talked mm -hmm. some about the uh, uh, some right. about that process, which was very interesting, and uh, you of course were were overseeing the entire thing. Uh, we had some experts, yeah. No, they both uh, Dave Gregory and, and um, Greg Leduc um, were recommended by a friend of mine who who's moved up to to the coast of of Oregon now, mm -hmm. and has been been sort of my video engineer and. Uh, and it was new stuff to them as well. Nobody had had their hands on these cameras, but but learning about negative and positive parallax and convergence and how to work these cameras was was an exercise that uh, I think we all sort of learned through this first first series of, of recording dates. Um, mm -hmm. But it was fairly clear to me with with previous technologies, the beam splitter technology, two cameras basically trying to to jimmy themselves in a relationship so you can be two and a half inches and and see the scenes that that technology just simply would not have been as efficient as we required to create six, even eight projects over the course of three days. Mm. Obviously, people are very well rehearsed and, and they come in and do their thing during fairly long days for the crew. But at the end of five or six hours, we have the album uh, from which then we do all the post-production work on. So it was it was it was credited to them and, and much thanks go out to Panasonic for a terrific piece of equipment. Um, which which allowed us to very simply um, capture both high definition and 3D. Now the Panasonic camera you were using uh, is a was a prototype at the time. I don't know if it's actually a commercial product yet, but it is. They came out at the end of August. Ah, okay, good. And it's relatively inexpensive. I mean, you were talking a moment ago about about uh, 3D camera rigs, which actually are contraptions that hold two separate cameras uh, and and beam split them so that you can can re record two different images, one for the right eye, one for the left eye. Very much more expensive, I think, than this Panasonic, uh, which comes in at something on the order of $20,000. Yeah, it's tw just $21,000, right? Mm -hmm. So that's far less, far less money than uh, any kind of uh, two camera rig, which would require two cameras for one thing, and then an expensive piece of hardware to hold them together and, and integrate them into a 3D shooting system. The disadvantage, of course, is that the interocular distance, that is the distance between the two lenses, is fixed. You can't change it, whereas in a big expensive rig, you can. Mm -hmm. That's true. The, the, there are certain compromises that come with these cameras, and, and we discussed what those would be. Um, but the, the sheer efficiency... Uh, for instance, one of the one of the limitations that that uh, was brought up to my attention is we're we're not going to be able to be extremely close up to somebody. It's usually an eight to ten foot uh, distance between camera and and subject. Mm -hmm. And and I said, well, you know, that's not really a problem. We'll zoom in if we need to zoom in a little bit, or we'll you know uh, we'll keep that in mind as we set up the positions for the cameras. But it also brought upon me that we we put a track back in the in the seats of the house rather than on the stage. So there's less technology actually on the physical stage than in the things that we've done in the past. So it really drove an additional set of thinking that I think actually improved the way that we we we've created the imagery that we've that we've captured with the four cameras that were granted to us and the monitors that went along with them. And so at the end of the day, um, 
this idea of a private performance with with the artists sort of gathered around you in your private home theater came off in 3D in a way that that stopped being a gimmick for me. I mean, I got home. E3 was the following week. I was very tied up during that week, but I got home with the with the hard drives and and the data that we had, and I taught myself how to do 3D post production <laughs> in a big hurry because uh, uh, Jeff Tully at, at uh, THX was in need of some footage for a, a CES plug-in back in New York. I said, oh, yeah, no, sure, I can get you some stuff. And so I basically mixed and then sunk up and edited all this material without ever seeing any 3D in front of my nose. It wasn't until a Sunday night, the, the Monday was the event, we were going to FTP the stuff, get some metadata tied into it for their project. Um, and I said, you know, Paul's big screen advertises that, that you know, we usually deliver within four hours or less. And I said, <laughs> I'll put him to the test. And then I, I called him about two o'clock in the afternoon. I, well, we've got a 50 inch over here for 2,200 bucks, whatever it was. And, and so I, it's not too far from here. I drove over there and started looking around in the, in the showroom and said, you know, I got this nice big studio behind me here. And, and with, uh, with people coming in to, to receive the demo and see the 3d stuff that we do, I better get a big TV. And so there was a 65-inch TV in the space as well, 3D, Panasonic, beautiful piece of equipment. Mm. And I bit. I, I said, well, there's just more credit card to, to swallow, but I've got to have a big TV. It's way oversized in my office, but it works very nicely here in, in this space. Is that and what so, we're seeing behind you there? <clears throat> no, this is actually standard projection oh. on a 146-inch uh, projection in, in where we do our THX film mixes and so forth. I see. Um, the big TV rolls in here, kind of sits in front of the the console mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people don the glasses when we when we do that um, i think you were i think you were right to to go for the bigger screen uh because i've always felt that 3d benefits greatly from th as large an image as possible you want to fill your field of view with that 3d you don't want to be able to see a lot of stuff around the screen that is in true 3d that is in reality <laughs> <laughs> as compared with what you're seeing on the screen, which is a, a simulated 3D, which is different, and it causes the brain some discomfort. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, there's a lot of learning that went along with it. And so, you know, I, I didn't know anything at the time. I simply took the left-right eyes and and uh, and laid them out in the timeline on Final Cut, and, and uh, they showed up, sure enough, that Sunday night at 7 o'clock. Um, a couple of guys actually have been here a couple of times with some other TVs that were purchased, and and uh, unloaded the TV, set it up on a baker's rack in my office, and I, I had purchased a, a DVI to HDMI connection cable and extender to go from the back of my Final Cut system. I teed it all up, if anybody's knowledgeable in the area, as, as side by side, like broadcasts are done. You have mm -hmm. half the image on one side and half the image on the other side for each independent eye. Mm -hmm. Put the TV in side by side mode, don the glasses, presto. I'm 3D. <laughs> it was just it was a magic moment. I uh, spent wow. a lot of time, a lot of money, and yeah, I've I've had my my share of 3D headaches from things that we did wrong, and I had to adjust in post production. But but Dave and 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 Greg said, yeah, you're going to have to to play with this stuff. But that mm -hmm. Monday we did manage to deliver a couple of samples that were shown back in uh, in New York. In fact, I think you were at that event, weren't you? I I was at that event. <laughs> that was the CEA line shows, and much yeah. to my surprise, which was only. <laughs> It was a very short time after I week. saw the shoot. I was in Zipper Hall watching the shoot and the recording session. And then I'm in back in New York a couple weeks later. And at the THX booth, here is footage from that shoot in 3D on a Panasonic 3D TV. And I went, whoa. <laughs> I know what Mark's been doing. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> He's been busy, but I have to say the result was phenomenal. Uh, yeah, among, among many things that I really like about the footage that I saw and subsequently the, the first Blu-ray disc that came out that you sent me is, well, for one thing, a couple things. One is the, the motion, most of the motion is relatively slow, which I really like. Um, you know, there's a lot of... A lot of 3D movies have this quick motion and it's action or it's animated and there's lots of stuff zooming around. And things in 3D, shot in 3D that move quickly, tend to break up and, and look either blurry or kind of double imagey. And 
on your stuff, everything looks rock solid, and I really, really liked that. That was a, a smart move on your part, which I think it, it fits. It makes sense with the yeah. material. You're shooting musicians playing, so it's not like a lot of fast action going on, except perhaps in their fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing that really uh, impressed me was there wasn't a lot of stuff coming out of the screen plane, coming in front of the screen plane. Most of what I saw was behind the screen plane, and I've always maintained that that is the most effective way to use 3D to get a sense of depth. And I think you, you did a really good job on that. It's, it's a really delicate balance. Look, the, the gentleman that's on the screen behind me in the blue shirt, Lawrence Juber, was in the same morning that this piece Goldberg disc is playing behind me. Um, and depending on, like I say, depending on where you actually set that convergence point, um, between the left and right eye, there's always, when you see a double image on the screen, there's always going to be a point where there's an image that is that is in the right plane, meaning mm -hmm. that, that if it's a microphone, for instance, or the front of a guitar or an instrument or the edge of a music stand, it will be in the right place for the right eye and the left eye. They won't be offset from each other. Mm -hmm. And that's the point where the screen exists. So you right. have control over scaling up the image and, and separating things. So that in general, most of the things that I've done, I will pull a lower third like you've got up in front of my name here. I can actually create that in layers of depth in front of the TV. Mm -hmm. Then on occasion, there will be, you know, items I did actually uh, deliberately do it down the neck of, of Lawrence's guitar when he played a solo. Mm -hmm. And I let the guitar neck stick out in front of the so you can almost reach out and want to retune his, his instrument. But <laughs> you're right. In general, it's, it's, it's a window viewing into the world of, as opposed to trying to join them, uh, have them join you in your physical space. Mm -hmm. um, as to the timing, uh, it's actually an editor's friend from, from my perspective, because um, most of the time when, when you're editing a piece of music, uh, you're, you're cutting with the beats and you're fairly, you're cutting fairly often because mm -hmm. it's, it's music and you're trying to create, you know, interest and, and quick cuts. You cannot quick cut in 3D because mm -hmm. your eyes have to have a period of, of adjustment. It might be a, a, you know, a half a second. But if you change that all the time, your eyes are constantly trying to adjust to different uh, degrees of this convergence and parallax. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, it was okay. We got another eight, 10 seconds we can go before we had to think about moving to another angle. And, and therefore the pacing of the edits is, is slower. And I think that does lend to the less headaches and less confusion from, from the brain eye connection. And, uh, and it does manage to work out pretty well. Look, mm -hmm. my, my things in, in terms of trying to create the, the kinds of, of projects that, that we had with this four camera shoot and the music that we do, Pyrotechnics and fancy lighting and dancing choreography are not part of what we do. Mm -hmm. I, I have to reinforce the fact that while we have this very innovative technology, and for those who have the new sets and are interested in the 3D, it's all there. But at the end of the day, for me, it's just as valid to say this is a music product where you listen to the same kinds of audio, same high-definition surround mixes that we do. And if you like the pictures, great. If you don't, simply put it in, you know, uh, uh, there's a button on the on the remote control of Blu-ray. It says, turn the video off. Just back mm -hmm. and listen. So I, I really think it's a, it's a really wonderful combination of both. I mentioned gimmick before, but at the end of the day, whether it was Todd Rundgren came in when he was here over the 4th of July for his gig, and Terry Lewis, of Terry Lewis and Jimmy Jam came in, and I sat them down, and I played this for them, and they just flipped. They just said, this is better than I thought it could ever be, and I felt the same way. It was worth the time, the investment, and, and basically the, the summer of, of learning the tools, learning what works and what doesn't work, and experimenting around with, with the creation of, of, of not only just coming up with the video and the audio edit, but then the, the major hill to, to get past the authoring of a Blu-ray title, because we're, we're deja vu all over again. In 1996, 97, we created the very first DVD video titles. Now... We're dealing with Blu-ray 3D, and the tools, again, are phenomenally expensive. So how do we get around this learning curve, equipment costs, MVC encoders, and the rest of it? Mm -hmm. and, and kudos go to my, my, my good friend John Harrington at NetBlender and their tool, Do Studio, because he really, in July, he called me up and said, how'd you like to deliver the first Blu-ray disc for a conference that was going on August 3rd? And I said, I can't do it without your help. And he came to the, he and his tech partner came to the, 
to the rescue and said, we'll, we'll get it there. And sure enough, on August 3rd, um, we walked in with the world's first music 3D project and what I'm calling now the first 3D music album. Mm -hmm. And what show was that? That's the one that's actually playing over my shoulder in the background. It was a, <clears throat> uh, it was a really easy one to license because I own all the content. It's a, it's a piece of Bach, my all-time favorite composer. that has been reimagined by some of my, my friends, uh, studio musicians, MB Gordy playing the drums back there. I went to CalArts with, um, and Jim Cox and Lawrence Juber from X of Wings, a phenomenal acoustic guitar player. Dean Parks, a studio icon. I mean, these were people that I said, okay, you guys are the band for Rita Coolidge later that afternoon. I would really appreciate you coming in a couple of hours early. And I had worked it up with Jim where we're going to take the Goldberg variations of Bach and we're going to reimagine this set of variations, except now in the hands of, of current musicians playing electric or amplified instruments in this you know, sort of classical style of recording, and we're going to capture the video in 3D. I've done a couple of projects like this in the past. One was the Moonlight Sonata of Beethoven, basically the same group, and and a Blu-ray now on Pachelbel's Canon. So this was an opportunity to to really not deal with any of the headaches that come from licensing and publishing and so forth. And we'll uh, we were able to to get all the video edited. I looked at every scene to make sure that everything was was just as it needed to be, and. We did manage to get them replicated, packaged, and, and handed them out at this Blue Focus con uh, conference at DTS back in early August. Mm, Blue Focus, that's what it was. Yep. <clears throat> um, let's, uh, let's go over, a, uh, just again, we, you, we talked about this on your last appearance on the show, but that was back in February. So uh, I'd love to reiterate a little bit about your basic philosophy on recording music and and mixing music in a variety of different ways on each of your albums people have the choice of how they want to listen to it um, as you said at the beginning you bring in musicians really fine musicians and set them into a a, a good acoustic space and we have to say that zipper hall in downtown <laughs> la across from walt disney hall one of one of the most renowned places uh, in the world now uh, is actually a fabulous acoustic space it is, and they have a beautiful instrument, nine foot Steinway, and and we know the setup there. I've built a relationship over the years with the administration and the people there. It's it's really, if there's a secret to the sound of, of an AIX recording, it's the fact of of that hall providing the musicians and the recording engineers, our people, uh, with the ability to really create the music in a, in a live setting where you don't need a lot of technology to pull off a a performance. Mm -hmm. And you got, yeah, and they're all on the same stage, and so there's there is some bleed between one microphone and the next. You've got each musician uh, mic'd very carefully, uh, and in some cases multi-mic'd. In the case of guitars, I believe you have at least acoustic guitars. You have at least two mics on them: one mm -hmm. near the sound hole, and one maybe up on the fingerboard. Um, it's more stereo pairs. I, I was uh, hmm. I mentioned to you that I just got back from. Uh, I gave the keynote address down in Bogota, Colombia, a week ago, a little over a week ago. Um, to a group of students from South America at the fourth annual Latin American AES at the invitation of Andres Mayo and, and uh, the other members of their committee, committee down there, Joel, the head of the AES in Latin America. And as I, as I explained, because the, the topic was 3D audio. <clears throat> Coincidentally, I'm doing 3D video with that 3D audio. But the topic really was how do we get this envelopment? How do we get this sound that happens? Uh, I think it's somewhat unique with our label. I certainly get a lot of very positive feedback and, and email comments and phone calls. But on a guitar, for instance, as you, as you mentioned, um, the fact is in the primeval, you know, evolution of, of hearing, it was really necessary for the hunters of, of 30,000, 50,000 years ago to know when that saber-toothed tiger was, was not only going to come after them for dinner, but to know how far they were. And so we have ears on, on both sides of our heads, not just so that we can tell left and right, but so that we can tell how far something is away from us because of phase relationships and, and the inverse square rule and how far something is in the distance uh, as it diminishes the amplitude. But by miking things in stereo, it's not just about left and right. For me, it's about creating the sense of depth or hole that exists behind the sound of the guitar player mm. so that... When I place those microphones into a, a, a left speaker or a center speaker as a, an ORTF pair, a, a stereo miking technique, the image comes out in between where there isn't a speaker, and the image is very, very, very deep. It, it, it 
transforms the room not into an array of five speakers with inward sound, but it really opens the space where Zipper Hall is then recreated in the space of your own home theater. Mm. And, and you can only do that by uh, using stereo miking technique. The, the traditional way that engineers are taught to do this is to take a microphone, place it uh, in front of the sound hole or closer to the bridge or strings, whatever, um, and then pan it. And if you mm. want it to be farther away, you turn down its volume and you add a, a certain amount of reverb. Since we don't add reverb and we, we play with stereo pairs, the sound is much more organic and it opens up the back of the instrument as a sound generating device. If you have ever held a guitar and strummed it, there's a lot of sound that vibrates from the back of the instrument off into space behind you. I was at, at Tavern on the Green when they were introducing the uh, Acura TL, a car that I own because it had a DVD audio system and surround system in it, and sat down. I, I met George Massenburg, Frank Filippetti, and Phil Ramon was there. All the big shot guys were there. And everybody had contributed more or less a track to the sampler that was Warner Brothers, I think, put it together for inclusion on the uh, ELS, the Elliott Shiner uh, Panasonic DVD audio system that's in the car. And it was, it was a perfect introduction because I had one track on that. It was actually an a cappella choir, 12 voice choir called Zephyr. And I, I don't remember if it was Frank or George or one of them said, you know, your track just sounded like it was in a hall. What, what reverb device did you use? <laughs> because the walls of the car actually disappeared. I mean, every other track, the Doobie Brothers were, uh, were inward from the speakers, and the walls of the car really disappeared. And I said it wasn't a reverb device at all other than the real time of a beautiful performance space. It's a luxury to record in a place like that. It's not easy to find the kind of space that can be mic'd up and where performers are happy and it's convenient locally, uh, you know, logistics, etc., but we have, and, and Zipper provides that for us, which is why, you know, only a couple times a year do we go down there for two or three days and set up our equipment, record, you know, four or five, six, even seven projects to, uh, to then spend the rest of the six months doing the post-production on. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a question from the chat room, which is, what format is the audio in? DTS Master Audio, True HD, PCM? These are all on, on our Blu-ray discs. We're using True HD which is actually a, a, a sort of upgrade to Meridian lossless packing. Bob Stewart's always been a good friend of mine at mm -hmm. Meridian, one of the most brilliant people on the planet I have found. And when he tells me that, that uh, what goes in comes out with validation, and then my friends at Dolby pick that up, add some channels to it, make it come through an HDM pipe, uh, HDMI pipe. I'm I'm a happy guy. I, I I love the way it sounds. It's just like the input, and as it should be, since it's a lossless coded uh, mm -hmm. uh, title. I have used, and I own all the tools for DTS as well, and I've used them on our samplers. But the Blu-ray discs that we're making in 3D are uh, are exclusively THD, true Dolby True HD. Mm -hmm. I guess you're using True HD instead of uncompressed PCM because even a Blu-ray disc you have. <laughs> space limitations right <laughs> you know i i'm i like to create a lot of of extras and options for people and and it was a little dismaying because i had put on the paper and mistakenly advertised uh on my website before i knew better that we would have seven one mixes from the audience and the stage perspective we mm -hmm. would have five one mixes from the audience and stage perspective as well as a 96 kilohertz 24-bit pcm stereo mix and guess what even with 25 gigabytes uh, there's not enough bandwidth and space to put all of that audio on at the same time. True HD is lossless. It's it's far more costly than Dolby Digital or regular DTS. And so it would have meant moving to a, a BD50 and the complexity that that brings into play to put the video on there a second time in order to get the 7.1. So given the uh, the rarity of 7.1 systems and, and uh, in home theaters, I stuck with 5.1 at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, 5.1 and uh, uh, Dolby True HD. Dolby True HD, but we do, as you said earlier, we do include, excuse me, we do include a, a, uh, a stereo mix at 9624. And I guess I could use Dolby True HD to do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and may actually going forward. We do a 5.1 from the stage perspective. So the musicians, if they're in your space, this, this room is about 30 feet by 24 by 12, 14 feet high, a nice size room. People have home theaters that are that are this big. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly rich people in Malibu or Beverly Hills, I guess. Um, <laughs> this is my room, although coming back here to watch a movie or something in the evenings, 
that doesn't happen. Um, but a room like this, imagine Rita Coolidge and her band or Mark Chestnut coming into this room to set up. There is not room at the other end for all of them to be clouded up against the front wall. So instead, maybe there'd be a drum set on one side. Maybe there'd be a piano on the other side with Rita in the front or the center flanked by a bass player and a guitar player. It's that kind of physical model that I'm following. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a model that mirrors what you see on the screen, which is probably the most often asked question and and complaint well you know the bass player is over there but i hear the sound coming out over there well if you realize that you're trying to make video interesting you can't be shifting the uh sonic image to match the picture uh all the time or or you'd be instantaneously changing perspectives on the audio these are audio first projects and and video comes comes second mm -hmm. we actually did get a question in the chat room just a second ago about that very about that very issue uh which is with high quality 3d surround mix and a 3d video uh shots from different angles is are, are there problems with cognitive dissonance between the sound view and the video view there, there undoubtedly is going to be that reality unless i was to take one camera which would be easier to do set it out in the audience straight ahead and look at the ensemble and never change it. Mm. So, and that's not interesting visually. Uh, you look at music videos, you look at performance videos. We did a thing with Wu-Tang years ago with this question was brought up. It's simply that cognitive dissonance, if it's referred to that, is something you're gonna have to live with. And if it bothers you substantially, turn off the video. And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, video is gonna be a few times watch, um, but at the end of the day, it comes back to the music for me. And, and I've listened to the, the Goldberg Variations is playing behind me probably 50 times. I'm mm -hmm. not bored. I'm not bored yet of the audio, but I don't need to put the glasses on and watch it 50 times, you know, in 3D video. <laughs> music, it, music has a special character. Yes, exactly. I was going to say that um, you can listen to a piece of music over and over again, a CD or a, or a Blu-ray of yours or whatever, uh, many times, uh, you don't normally watch a movie more than a couple of times. There might be a few exceptions, but... Caddyshack. <laughs> <laughs> That's a classic. There are those I, movies, but you're absolutely right. I use that very same argument. I mean, and the same thing is true for me, by the way, with, with live concerts. Because you have a PA system, because you have a large screaming crowd of people out there in, at the venue... I'm a one-time listen. I'm a one-time watch guy. I really don't enjoy the sound quality. I don't want people clapping. I would like to be there at Studio B or Abbey Road when the Beatles or, or Bonnie Raitt are making a record and hear it as if they were performing live for me. That's the kind of, of that's the conceptual basis for our entire label and what we've done all these years. Mm -hmm. I must admit, I'm with you. Uh, you and I have talked about this before, that uh, I tend to prefer the what, what you call the stage mix, which is the instruments all around you. But then again, you and I are both professional musicians, and we're <laughs> used to having mu the musicians all around us. I've heard a lot of people who aren't performers say that they prefer the audience mix, which you also provide on your discs, right. which is the all of the music, all of the uh, coming from the front, three uh, channels, and the rear channels, the surround channels being used for ambience in the hall. That's right. Is, yep. is there any difference uh, in this cognitive dissonance question between those two mixes, I wonder? You know, I'm not sure there would be enough to, to, to tilt it one way or the other. I answered, actually, I played both mixes down for a group assembled in, in Bogota at this university a week ago, mm -hmm. and and uh, and then asked. I said, okay, if you, if you preferred the, the audience mix, raise your hand. A couple people did, but most people liked to be in the midst of the sound. Um, I was a judge down there for for the 5-1 surround competition. The students had done their, their various works, both pop and, and classical. And to me, I, you know, you kind of got to put your ears, your hands up to your ears to find out what's going on behind you. Uh, if there's really any sound in there in the surround speakers or not. Uh, I certainly add both because reviewers and, and people that are important, I guess, you know, have accused me of being a conductor wannabe when I make a classical mix of a symphony <laughs> and put you on the podium with the conductor. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that. It's, you know, um, it's just a... a offering up options to people. As I explained it the other day, you know, it's really what the approach that I've developed and, and, and I think uh, refined over the course of the 10 or 12 years that I've been doing records like this 
is that you remember what happened when Wyndham Hill came along and, and all of a sudden, you know, a single microphone in front of a guitar three feet away wasn't the sound that cut it for, for, uh, for Wyndham Hill and, and Will Ackerman and, and Michael Hedges. So what they did was they took a stereo pair of microphones and they crammed it right up next, just out of the range of where the hands were moving. And it gave you a sense of this amazingly intimate sound. It was new age music and they put reverb on it. And, but there were wonderful performances that were really intimate and they built up basically an entire company around this sound. Classical music, however, which is sort of uh, another animal altogether, was always about a, a spaced pair or a deck of tree or bloom line stereo pair in a live hall. Let them play, let's capture the space uh, as well as the performers from a distance. Mm -hmm. And it's a well, you know, I like the sound of Wyndham Hill, and I love classical music. Maybe there's a way that we can combine the two of these together. And and having gotten my my PhD with a, a monograph and big study on on binaural audio or how we hear in stereo, um, using binaural heads and so forth, I said, well, let's let's take the stereo approach, and and apply it very close up like Wyndham Hill does, and do that to classical music. So that I've got this sense of intimacy. I put microphones inside the piano. I, I don't, I'm not shy about being close up to the instruments. Um, and I find that when you put your head inside of a piano, it sounds pretty nice. Or when you're up close to the sound of a bass, um, there's a certain resonance that you get that you, that you don't get by just simply putting a microphone 15 feet away. And but by using the technology, then to create this sense of intimacy to, in the case behind me, a septet, um, it creates a sense of bonding with the music that you can't get by sitting, you know, in the in the fifteenth row of the best seat in, in the hall. Uh, but doesn't close miking also reduce or even eliminate any sense of the acoustic space? It does, unless you also have a an ORTF pair sitting on the edge of the stage, just like you normally would, and then ah, one more set mix that the in. BKs, which are out in the back capturing the reverb. Uh, ORTF, can you define that for our guests it's or our the, listeners, please? It's uh, uh, the Office of Radio and Television Francaise. It's a French technique that puts two microphones about 110 degrees between them and about 10 inches apart. Mm. As opposed to, there are several different stereo oh, miking XY, techniques. XY puts them right on top of each other for mono compatibility. You put a couple of figure eights and you get bloom line, a couple of spaced omnidirectional microphones. There's all kinds of different ways to capture stereo we were talking about that tuesday night in my recording class some of which adhere more to the to the uh, model of the human head and, and our ability to hear um and some not so the you know the binaural head is probably the perfect example of something that emulates the way we hear but it's not phase coherent and it's a little bit more difficult to hang binaural heads in front of a guitar than it is to put a couple of ortf uh pencil type microphones in front i can't mm -hmm. imagine the, the visual of, of, you know, half a dozen Fritz Neumann heads placed around the, the ensemble up in front of me or behind me here. It would be, uh, it would be distracting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah these sort of fake uh, uh, yeah. mannequin heads with, with little mics in their ears. I've seen that, that situation. It can oh, yeah. produce a pretty nice sound, but oh. you're right. It's, it's distracting. No doubt. I, I, I did a lot of recording with the KU81, uh, which was, was that microphone with my nogger went in a hot air balloon and out in the ocean in a cavern up north. I, I did my, my PhD was actually a binaural piece that was all recorded with, with this Fritz head. Mm. I got a question in the chat room. Uh, uh, <laughs> this guy wants to be really geeky. What are some of the notable pieces of equipment in your recording playback mastering chain? We start with, I mean, the only thing that's worth buying these days uh, is a lot of fine microphones. So I use B&K microphones and Neumanns. I've got a couple of modded uh, AKG 414s, a lot of large diaphragms, uh, as well as 460s. I don't know, we've got 30, 40 microphones like that. And and my good friend Wes Dooley out at Audio Engineering Associates, um, every time I call him up, he and Renee are happy to offer up their ribbon microphones. So I use those for vocals and for brass um, and have done so for uh, ever since we've been recording. I've known Wes for 20, 25 years. Um, those go into benchmark uh, mic pre's. They go into the uh, A to D converters that are part of the Euphonics uh, recording and, and uh, console that I've got behind me. There's crystal semiconductors at 96K, 24 bits. Uh, we capture on a Nuendo system at 96K, 24-bit PCM. I do not 
endorse DSD or one bit uh, conversion in, in SACD land. It creates too much why noise. Not? It creates, it creates too much noise. That, that's the reason way why. Way too much noise. Way too much noise. It's all, it's all shifted out of the range, and then you have to filter it off at the high end. That, that'll create a bunch of, of comments and questions. I know there's a lot of SACD <laughs> fans out there, but I'm not one of them. Okay. PCM, PCM is the way. And then, then it's all digital. This machine behind me, I don't know if you can see it or not, but that machine behind me is a control surface, an expensive control surface, a System 5 console from Euphonics. It basically just says when the volume needs to go up and down or where you pan something or how much, uh, you know, to the left or right you're going to put it in the stereo field. Or focus mm -hmm. is a really cool knob that, that distributes information between a couple of adjacent speakers. That comes out, um, the same crystal semiconductors come out and send it into a... Uh, uh, amplification system that's Bryston power amplifiers, 9Bs, and into my favorite speakers, the B&W 801 Series 3s. Mm, mm, very nice, very nice. The Nuendo system's running on a, a Windows PC? It is, yeah, it's a PC. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we uh, have a couple more questions here from the chat room. Uh, I like the stage mix, so Aaron B. says, but sometimes... Well, an example is the live DVD of Eric Clapton, and there's a moment where someone gives a hoot from your rear left that takes you, uh, that uh, takes you out into the concert. I think he means out of the concert. Uh, is there a sense of? Uh, I, I don't. I don't think in your case I've ever heard uh, one of your recordings do this, but I think it, you do have the uh, risk anyway when you're doing a, a multi-channel stage mix, in particular, of it of it kind of getting distraction, distracting or gimmicky. Certainly, early examples of multi multi-channel music I, I found that to be um have you it, it's true i mean um there there are personal taste issues here on on the way that people like to listen to music and on on as we've done 53 projects now uh somewhere along the way because there isn't a handbook or some kind of guidebook that says here's the model for doing five one surround sound mm. um, i had to make a choice and and i decided that side of the room is going to have the drum set in the stage mix. And that side of the room, if there is a piano, is a nine-foot instrument that can compete with the drums and and so forth. So I sort of created my model, my nominal setup. Regardless of what's going on on the screen, in the video, um, and, and so there'll be a drum set next to the side of you. You can lean back and the drum set will be less over your shoulder or you can switch the audience mix button and then all that stuff will will fold more to the front and be in front of you with uh, with ambience coming out of the, the left and right surround speakers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and there's even stereo on there for people that have, you know, if you've got a pair of BMW 801s or 800Ds or something like the chances of having five of them is fairly remote. Uh, mm -hmm. I, had to buy, I had to buy, you know, six in order to get 5.1 in, in my room. So I perfectly understand that people have different tastes and, and, and are comfortable with music in different ways. But I completely detach the directionality from the physical model at the end of the day. I mean, the story mm -hmm. I tell is being, being laid underneath a nine-foot piano for a four-hour concert of Morty Feldman music by a solo piano. And the pianist <laughs> was a teacher of mine, and I laid underneath that instrument for four hours on a pillow. And, and a rug and was completely transformed. It, it matters not where the sound comes from as long as the end result, and I consider myself part of that creative process, mm. is enhancing the musical experience. It does not have to, to represent so strictly the physical reality. I mean, think about it. I, I, I remember a guy at, at one of the audiophile uh, presentations, a publisher, um, saying, you know, the Beatles records don't represent an acoustic reality at all nor True. does peter gabriel these are these are produced constructed sonic projects that made hit, hit records so i i'm i have the license or i've taken the license to to bend some of those rules even if it's a string quartet or or the group back in 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 the screen behind me mm -hmm. um pick what you like thankfully there's been enough people out there that have written me back saying you know there's nobody else's stuff that sounds like this Thank you. Keep making more. I, I mm -hmm. wish it's easier to make a living at it, but um, so it goes. Yeah. What about uh, uh, downloading? I know that you you run a service called iTrax at iTrax.com, I-T-R-A-X.com, um, where you offer some of your material in a downloadable m m format. Now, it, will some of this uh, 3D video be available in that way, or is it just too big? You know, it... 
too big is not a word that applies anymore now with 10 <laughs> megs up <laughs> and down or right. fios i mean i was talking to my class this morning when you know yeah i, I bought a 20 meg hard drive imagine that uh <laughs> for 700 dollars or whatever it was back in, i remember in, the pre-dawn and eighteen hundred dollars worth of four megs of RAM. So, you know, the joke continues. So, so space isn't the issue. Yes, iTrax is a a dedicated site to absolutely real high definition content. There are other sites out there, some even with the high definition moniker in front, that are not high definition at all. I mean, a, a tape from nineteen sixty three put into a ninety six k twenty four bit bucket or a DSD super audio cd uh, uh or even a cd up converted to to high res doesn't make the original fidelity high res so i have major complaints from from some uh other quarters in terms of what high definition really is defined as but i've even um, i've even heard tell of, of some of that material in fact as you say being uh 16-bit 44-1 cd material up sampled to 96-24 it's that's like taking standard definition and upscaling it to high definition and calling it high definition. It isn't. And we have the same problem with two to three D conversion. I exactly. mean, you go see Clash of the Titans, or or you wait for the release of Star Trek on three D. As long as it's identified for what it really is, I don't have a problem. But eye tracks, it will always be smaller. Will always have less repertoire associated with it. Probably won't have video anytime soon. I just don't have the, the economic wherewithal to hire the programming and do the, the, the work that's necessary to, to put these things down that way. It's far cheaper to buy the disc anyway uh, at this point, the Blu-ray mm. versions. Mm -hmm. But I did want to make sure that the, the stuff was available because I, as much as I'm a fan of Blu-ray right now, which wasn't always the case, um, it still is, is the future is in downloads. Uh, or streaming, if we ever get to the point where we can stream high-definition multi-channel content. The problem mm -hmm. on the other end is the CE companies or the music servers don't exist to do high-resolution multi-channel. You have to build your own and kludge together a system with a PC, a home theater PC, and put three DACs on the back that are stereo and common clock them. And, and so it's, it's a challenge. We do offer almost all of the stuff that we do on our label, all the San Francisco media, uh, Mahler, Recordings are available. Uh, we did a thing with Zemf Innovations or Zemf Studios on Rachmaninoff plays Rachmaninoff. These recreations that Sony Classics does on CD, they gave us the right to put out the multi-channel high-resolution versions of those as downloads. Um, uh, Harmonia Mundi puts all of their stuff available, uh, but not all of it's real high def. So I rejected, you know, 30, 40 percent of it, saying this has got to have been recorded at the time musicians were present in high def. It makes a difference. In yes. the listening experience, especially over the long term, to listen to something that's been over compressed or was recorded at 44 1 16 bits and something that's recorded um, at 96K 24 bits or, or better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Another problem uh, I've identified <coughs> with uh, streaming and downloading, uh, certainly video uh, and, and high resolution audio, as you're doing, particularly multi channel, is that the bandwidth coming into the typical American home isn't that high we we as a country are lagging way behind much of the rest of the world in terms of commonly available bandwidth oh so true i mean it's been i've been in this building now four years as of what two months ago maybe six weeks ago something like that um i finally convinced uh time warner to bring fiber into the building but mm. what you can get through fios at your house for a hundred bucks a month costs you know a thousand dollars a month um and you're not even getting as much bandwidth Eventually, eventually that problem will go away, and and everybody will have this kind of bandwidth, and there'll be compression algorithms that that improve the the situation. I just am unwilling to live with anything less than 96 kilohertz, 24 bits, um, as we as we listen to uh, surround music in, in high def. Mm -hmm. it looks like my, my program ended back there, maybe. Yeah, you're getting a little you're you're a little dark there because yeah. the uh, exposure is is switched to the to the uh, menu can't. screen, which is very bright. While you're doing that, um, I will uh, tell you that we do have one other question, uh, which is a little bit off topic. Uh oh, I'm running on <coughs> running on reserve battery power here. Oh no. Uh oh. <clears throat> Uh, I only have a few minutes, so and I think we only have a few minutes left on our recording, so I think it's going to work out okay. Um, we did get a, a question from the chat room that says, um, what do you think of electrostatic speakers, or do you prefer 
uh, directional dynamic speakers such as the B&Ws you have in your studio? Um, can't say. I mean, I know Martin Logan's, I, I, Kef's and, and some others from, from years ago with my stereophile buddies. Um, and I've been to, I go to the audio shows uh, and, and, and audition the rooms. I just find that for my ears and, and listening to very, very extended periods that, um, that I prefer uh, direct radiating speakers. And I actually had the opportunity at, at one of the shows, B&W was kind enough to send a, a, a set of five, actually it was six, we didn't unbox one of them, um, down in Florida in a big room uh, of the 800Ds. And I had um, Boulder power amplifiers. I mean, these things are thirty, fifty thousand dollars for a stereo pair. Um, very expensive. And I spent the whole day in there demoing. But I'm off to the side in the corner. I went back that night and spent another hour and a half listening to my recordings in a non-acoustically treated space. You know, it was a compromise all the way around. But there was more music coming through those speakers than I had ever heard in my life because these diamond tweeters and the fact that there is, when you do a spectrogram analysis of, of high-definition recordings, real high-definition recordings, um, a Harman mute does create frequencies that are over 48 kilohertz. Mm. Uh, that sound is in that spectrograph. Now, it may not be that you're going to put your ear up during a test and say, yeah, I hear that tone at 48K, but <laughs> I would like to know that if that horn is putting out that sound into that acoustic space, that I'm cap capable of capturing it and reproducing it back into the space where you do your listening. That's as close to the real thing as you can get. And the arguments whether you can hear up there are, are moot to me. I just want to know that with the technology that we've got, both from a consumer perspective and pro, that we can recreate that and give it to the customers that may or may not be able to tell the difference at the end of the day. Do you, and this is, uh, I'd like to address that argument in the last couple minutes we have here. Do you really think it's, it's uh, relevant, valuable, um, perceptible to record 48 kilohertz tone sounds and, and be able to reproduce them? I mean, does it really make a difference to the human hearing system? I believe it does. Hmm, I believe why is it that? does. That, well, the, the one test that I heard um, Rupert Neve years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, was that they took basically an, uh, a 17K sine wave and a 17K square wave. Mm -hmm. And they played short bursts randomly to a, an audience. And if, if you know your math, the next overtone or the, you know, the, the second partial of a 17 kilohertz tone should be out of the human hearing. That's it's, right. Now, the sine wave would not, have a, would not have an overtone. It would be a pure right. tone. The square, the square wave, wave would would have so something you, theoretically at you would not be able to tell the difference, right? I'm oh, sorry. Theoretically, then you would not be able to tell the difference as you played the square wave versus the sine wave. That's correct. Eighty-five percent of the people could. Interesting, and, and, another, and we were sure that we were sure that the, the playback difference. we were sure that the playback system and the speakers uh, were capable of reproducing that high, those high frequencies, thirty-four kilohertz and above. Yep. Oh, that's not hard to do. I guess that's true. Certainly, we see a lot of speakers these days with specs up into the 40, 50 kilohertz range. And microphones, and, too. And microphones, too. But what about, what about the uh, play, playback electronics? Well, you, you do a high-definition you know, 96, 882, or 192 PCM. Yes, you can reproduce, capture and reproduce that, that frequency range. And 85% of the audience could tell the difference between the square wave and the sine wave. They knew there was a difference, yes. Which means that they could, that was something coming through from that square wave at the higher harmonics of that square wave that was actually making it into some sense of perception in 85% of that audience. That's exactly right. Now, again, wow. it's not an argument that I, I'm, I'm happy to have with people anymore. It just, you know, because there's plenty of people out there that love vinyl and analog tape and all the rest of it. So I just would like to know that that sound is in the sound that I record if it was there coming out of a Harman mute on Wallace Roney's recording. Mm -hmm. And if it is, then I should design my system to recreate that as much as possible. Yeah, I believe, like I say, at the end of an eight-hour day sitting in my room mixing and listening to this, this arrangement, these speakers... Versus spending eight hours listening to a heavily compressed rap track coming off of a, or even a classical CD, I can tell the difference. I am fatigued. I have, you know, uh, 
a sense of, of, of wear and tear listening to standard resolution material that I don't with high def. And I, I can't explain it other than I must believe that if we can do it, we should. And, and that's certainly the, the concept and the, and the tenets by which AIX Records has, has uh, uh, followed over the course of the 12 years we've been, been doing this now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's been a great success during those 12 years. I followed your career and I followed, I've listened to your recordings and they are really stunning. So I do recommend that people go out and find them and listen to them and uh, be amazed at the quality of the recording and of the musicianship that you that you bring to the table. So uh, I want to thank you, Mark uh, Waldrop, for being on the show. It's been a great conversation and I really appreciate it. It's been, always been my pleasure, Scott. Thank you so much. Thank you. You can uh, get to Mark's website at AIXrecords.com. Uh, my online homes are ultimateavmag.com and hometheatermag.com. And uh, you can email me at scott at twit.tv and follow me on Twitter at HTGeekScott. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Don Stewart of Stewart Film Screens. He is the steward in Stuart Film Screens and knows everything there is to know about projection screens. So I'm really looking forward to talking with him, and I sure hope you'll join me. Until then, geek out. Geek out.